welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the Collider Weekly Podcast for all things animation, including reviews and interviews, coming to you from Thebes, Egypt. I'll be your co-host, Sean Paul Ellis, and joining me from the tomb of Brandon Fraser's movie career, so my co-host. <laughs> it's not, it's we'll pretty, get into it's it. It's pretty mean. Okay, but you hear him now, my co-host, Dave Trumbor. David, 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 how you doing, buddy? You can hear me. You can see me from inside the tomb as well, hopefully, if, <laughs> if everything works out with our video recording for the first time ever in 300 years or episodes, <laughs> whatever. Uh, it's good other than it being real dusty in here, which plays hell with the electronics. Other than that, and it's doing fine. It's not crowded at all being in there with Brendan Fraser's career. It's pretty empty. It's, uh, it's kind of sparse. There's not a lot to really fill it up with here. So Okay. I, I do, I do want to be mindful brendan fraser really super fun actor oh yeah he has done great. he has done a ton of things he seems Rest in peace. like what what Rest, he's not dead oh just his career oh i see just his career his he's fine not turns either. out he he was in the fx show trust bedazzled. recently a couple years ago bedazzled what <laughs> wasn't he in bedazzled was he, I, I don't have no idea With elizabeth hurley as the devil <laughs> Oh, God. That's the yeah, first thing that came to mind. I don't know why Encino Man didn't pop in. I don't know why Airheads didn't pop in. To be dazzled. I mean, he's been. the first one I went to. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking of a journey to the center of the earth. Sure, before The Rock took over. Yeah. Right. Same yeah, with right. The Mummy, weirdly. Same with The Mummy. Weirdly enough. Oh, uh, is there anybody who can help us understand? Is The Rock just following Brendan Fraser's? movie career it kind of would make Lost sense Ends. if you just followed the hairline like as Bre- and i hate to poke fun at him but you know we have to mention it as yeah Brendan watch it buddy Fraser i don't have much it. of a hairline either dude. that's okay we keep that off camera so you're okay but like clearly the rock didn't ha- he he shaved that all off so it was kind of like he came in as like a, a more buff brendan Fraser, and then just didn't even have hair to care about so i don't know it's a weird and, weird career move there for brendan i will say for brendan yeah i'm loving doom patrol yeah that is a fantastic show. I'm in season two right now. It's wonderful. I love him as Robot Man. And very, very fun. Good for him for putting all that, you know, aesthetics, uh, effects, makeup, and stuff on each and every episode because that's probably not easy to do. So kudos to him. Is it effects or isn't it just like a costume that he slips into? I'm, well, I mean that, but I'm sure they have like, uh, to me, I just consider that sort of effects stuff, costuming stuff. Unless who's they just the, took his human skin off. Who's building robot makeup on top of his face? <laughs> I really hope that that's what they do. I hope they took his human skin off and he was just robot man underneath. This is not like a, a Nick Cage face-off it's with not? John Travolta situation. Well, not at be. all. Doom Patrol season three. You heard it here oh first. I mean, I would still watch the hell out Heck of yeah. that. If they got Nick Cage on there as literally any character he wants to be, even just Nick Cage. Hear me out on this. Okay, here we go. Face off two. Yeah. And it's Brendan Fraser and The Rock, and they're fighting over who gets to be in the next Mummy. The Mummy <laughs> seven, four? Where are we even now? They've rebooted right. this thing, I don't know how many times in the last hundred years since like the original 1930s runs. Uh, struggling. They struggle to get <laughs> to get this one off the ground. I, I am actually very excited to talk a little bit yeah. about the Mummyverse and all of the movies that are included in it, and kind of clear up some things regarding where the actual cartoon that we're talking about tonight. We are talking about the animated version called The Mummy, yeah. and we happen to watch three episodes that were covertly compiled into one special yeah. called. Quest for the Lost Scroll. This is now streaming, and you can find this for free on Peacock TV. If you are not familiar with Peacock TV, don't worry about it. Nobody else is. Nobody else is either. Oh, boy. I don't even know if Peacock TV knows what Peacock TV is at this point. So We know they got the Mummy animated series, which literally no one knew about until we happened upon it on Peacock TV. So kudos to you, NBC Universal, for bringing this to our attention. Uh, will it hold up? Will it be dipped at the end of this episode? I don't know. You have to hang out and find out. I feel like that. I mean, I, I mean, if if you're not familiar and if you're a first time hmm. listener and now watcher, yeah, maybe we have a little mechanic at the end where if we recommend something, if you know, we can tell you why. If we don't recommend something, we can go one step further and we can dip a cartoon from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, get rid of that cartoon. We won't really talk about it in a positive light 
or ever on this show <laughs> just mention it again. ever again it'll be things that as an as an old man i'll just kind of shake my fist and just kind of like scream up towards the sky mm-hmm. about it uh and give the angry old man fist but that's that's the only way that we'll actually reference the show if something gets dipped you've been you might be asking yourself have cartoons been dipped oh yeah i think we've dipped about maybe five or six cartoons realistically over the course of 279 episodes very very small very small fraction, fraction of the of amount percent. of cartoons that we've watched yeah maybe very tiny maybe two percent i don't know i'd have to go back and actually look maybe less than that yeah, yeah. It, it's it's very minuscule yeah. so but it happens so it's rare what we're saying is it's rare correct it's as correct. rare it's rarer than a streaming service these days, which I think Peacock TV is the last of the like major streaming services. But let me ask you this. Is did it? you did you what did you have a harder time believing that there was a mummy animated series that existed or that Peacock TV was also a thing that existed? I it, I, I was equally frustrated with both. And may I, I want to explain a little bit sure. why Peacock TV came out this week correct yeah by the time you guys are listening to it i mean it's it's weirdly launching on a number of different services at different times so you can probably get it on playstation now like when you're hearing it but (laughs) when we're recording it you can't because it did not show up on launch day so that's weird and fun but yeah for the most part you can kind of get it anywhere in a browser in various apps on the playstation you should be able to have access to it now but who knows but but can you get it in a browser? But because you? you and I had very different experiences oh, yeah. where you were able to watch it in a browser. I was not. I received a Shrek a Puss, harsh, uh, Puss in Boots. Harsh message. Yeah, a message that said something went wrong. Disconnect this from your external monitor. And my answer to Peacock is uh, no. Why? Why would I ever do that? That sounds like a terrible idea. The fact that this is checking to see if I have an external monitor hooked up to weird. my laptop. Who cares, Peacock TV? NBC Universal does because they want you to use that app or the PlayStation. I don't know. It's it's very strange. It's all very strange. There has yet to be one streaming service that's rolled out with anything that made any kind of sense. I, I don't know why literally any of them didn't just be like Netflix, but us. Like just copy Netflix. Their model, yeah, the just. look, the design. The, the metrics, the social media, copy it all. It works. It's fine. How, how are they Just not add your content this? to your own thing. I don't know. So bad. But anyway. Peacock TV will we'll just we'll prime the engine with this. Thank God you're free. Yeah. Free and freemium. There's some freemiums out there. I don't know if you uh, want to do that. Uh, we're not sponsored by Peacock TV in case you haven't figured that out. Uh, yeah. Probably won't be either in the near future. Uh, I'll say this to NBC Universal. Yeah. If you would like to give us money, we will gladly accept it and give you the same critical feedback that we are going to give as a part of this episode. Because yep. you got to get your crap together. I will say I to their this. benefit, I now know that there is a mummy animated series. Is that a benefit? It's. I like having information. Uh, I'm not <laughs> saying that it's good or bad. You'll have to listen. But I didn't know that existed I like, before. I just... I, Eddie... When you try to talk about mm-hmm. the value of a streaming service, mm-hmm. if your core value prop to somebody to use and leverage that system is you're going to know information now. You're going to know things you that's, didn't know before. That's a, that's a terrible thing, and you've missed the mark completely. It's a pretty low bar at this point. Gosh. Pretty low bar. It is bar. bad. Yeah. But hey, we Dave. found out. And the weird thing is like everybody at the site, everybody at Collider, none of us knew that The Mummy had an animated series. We've covered, you know, 300 some odd cartoons on this show. We didn't know there was an animated series. And that came out in the heyday of like Mummy movie time where, right. well, you have information on like when it came out, when it's supposed to be set and how it fits into the Mummy movie verse. But yeah, none of us knew that. So I don't know if they buried this show or if it just it ran its course and we just happened to miss it in that weird window of time. Uh, but here it is now, so buckle was, up. Was the buried comment, was that a pun? It was. Is that a mummy in a tomb pun? It's a mummy in a tomb pun. Mm-hmm. Not oh, a boy. good one, but it is one. Uh, well, Dave, yeah. I would love to discuss all the problems with Peacock TV for the next hour, <laughs> sure. but we're not, That's not here this to talk about Peacock TV. Nope. It's a bonus point that we get to be critical about in the meantime talking about the animated version of the mummy if you are not familiar like i want to say a hundred percent of everybody who is listening or just 
you know, alive during the time that this show aired. Except again, Stephen Summers. Been, yeah. Yeah, except Stephen Summers. We are going to turn this over to longtime friend and listener of the show, Bobby Anthem, for a synopsis on The Mummy. So, Bobby, take it away. Based loosely on the hit movies The Mummy and The Mummy Returns, the O'Connells find themselves pursued by the undead corrupt high priest Imhotep and his lackey, Colin Weasler, who are after the manacle of Osiris. This quest takes the family around the world as they locate the Lost Scrolls of Thebes, the only things that can remove the manacle from young Alex O'Connell's wrist. However, the scrolls may have to be destroyed to prevent Imhotep from possessing it. In the second season, retitled as The Mummy, Secrets of the Magi, Alex is trained as a magi to combat the mummy and other new threats along the way. Awesome. Thank you, Bobby. We appreciate you as always. Always. Dave, yeah. where do we want to put Bobby Anthem in the mummy universe? On that throne, man. Pharaoh. On that throne. Pharaoh yeah. Bobby. I kind of want a hero mummy though, right? Like they're always villains too, yeah. for some reason. I feel like if you could bring a mummy back from thousands of years ago, it'd be kind of cool to just like hang out with them and just be like, so just like, oh God, I almost said let's rap. I almost did it. Oh. I almost did it, but I stopped myself because even that was unacceptable. <laughs> Don't do it, dude. Don't do it. Uh, but no, like I, I'd love to just hang out with a mummy and just like, just tell me about your life. And if that that mummy happened to be Pharaoh Bobby, uh, even better. I would think if we were to reanimate a mummy yeah. and they had to live in 2020, oh, no. they would think to themselves, I would rather go back into the tomb. At yeah, point. I'd rather go through the embalming process again. <laughs> Right. I'd rather get my organs back, put them back in first, and then take them back out and put me back in that tomb rather than be here in 2020. 2020 yeah, mummies. I really, I really think that 2020 mummies would say, uh, we had it better when we yeah, were worshipped we were and sand. then put into this cool thing. Yeah. I want to I wanna yeah. posit this idea, though. Sure. Now that we're possibly a video-ish podcast, which is mostly just our faces and still images, uh... <laughs> I would love to actually have either fan art or commissioned art for for what we make Bobby into for every episode. <laughs> so poor Bobby. <laughs> Sorry, Bobby. But I would love, like, if I could have an image up right now that was just like Pharaoh Bobby, that would be amazing. I would love that. Oh, no. So whether it was fan art or if I have to doodle something myself, Sean is, is currently doodling it on his iPad right now, so maybe we'll get that up, but... I feel no, like I we can maybe. That. I feel like maybe we can reach out to our friend Brian Ty Fair, who sure. has actually animated Bobby previously, and and check and see if he has any thoughts on. I this. would so, love to have a collection of just like Bobby characters from every episode, and we could put them up while you listen to his voice uh, read you the synopsis. That would be amazing. Oh, that would be fun. I that would, would like be that. fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on board with that. Okay, let's let's workshop that. That's a good idea. Okay, great. Guys, this is what business meetings look like. Yeah, basically just this with, with giant mummy eyes looking down on Podcast you from above. Podcast business meetings look like. Yeah. Oh no. We're efficient. Get it done. All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit now about the Mummy animated series, Oof. and let's talk about quest for the Lost Scrolls. We should mention uh, that this is actually season one, episode one. 12 and 13 they duped us put together yep. they really duped us on it's a this it's one. a recap special before you for whatever reason go into season two you can just watch this hour instead and you'll pretty much get the gist of season one which we didn't know right. we, we had no information on this until we actually got into it because i don't think anybody on the internet cared enough to put information together even the wikipedia <laughs> article is pretty scant uh, we had to do our own kind of like archaeological uh discovery for this stuff we just had to watch it essentially Right. Just like Indiana Jones. So, yeah. Oh, man. Well, we are going to talk about these three episodes compiled into this season one recap yeah. special? Question mark? Sure. Shrug. In order to do this, we are going to talk about the good, the bad, and the LOL. Does this sound like Clint Eastwood Spaghetti Western? 100%. That's where we are pulling the idea and the inspiration from. We're going to talk about the good, things that we absolutely liked about this program, we are going to talk about the bad things that just didn't resonate or oh, hit with us. Oh boy! Yeah, <laughs> but the, wrap wrap that mouth up right now, but we're not done yet. We're in this for the long haul. 
And we're gonna talk about the LOL, things that made us laugh, whether it was intentional or unintentional for the mummy in these three episodes sure. that we have had a chance to watch. We are putting this all inside of the, the warm, snug, compliment sandwich slash burrito of recognizing that a lot of time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears, and namely money mm. goes into making all of these cartoons that we're talking about. This is our snap judgment and impression about this. This may have been something that you watched and you really loved as a kid or growing up or even as an adult whenever you were watching this. Maybe you're just the ultimate mummy fan. That's fine. If you have a difference of opinion, feel free to let us know on Twitter at Morning Tunes. Just remember it's morning with a U. You can let us know what your experience is. But for us, we are going to review this based off of this season one recap special that we watched. So let's get into the good. Oh, yeah. All right, Dave. Yeah, the good. What what did you enjoy? What what was fun? What resonated with you? Sure, I will say I I like the premise. Right, we talked about we talked about this a little bit offline, but we liked the Mummy movies. I love the originals, even though they're not really the best of the kind of Universal Monsters original set. They're kind of they're a little slower. They're they're quite literally just stumbling through some stuff. They're not quite as I they are iconic, but they're not to me. On the same level as like a Wolfman, Frankenstein, Dracula. But the really action-packed ones uh, from late 90s, early 2000s, Stephen Summers, those were great. Those were super fun. It was like the last kind of like great action-adventure blockbuster movie you could see in a theater. Uh, I really can't think of anything that's kind of topped that experience since. There's even a great ride at uh, Universal Studios. Uh, The Mummy ride's fantastic. So all of that kind of stuff was like... It was cool. Like, I wanted to play more in that world. So when I just found out 20 years later that there was an animated series, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. There's a lot of uh, a lot of adventures to have, a lot of stories to be told. And I like these characters. And we're sticking with the same characters, essentially the extended O'Connell family. So cool. Yeah. Let me let me play some more with that world. The problem is you can have a great idea. You still have to execute on it. And uh, we'll save that <laughs> discussion for the next section. But yeah, how about you? What was kind of some like high level, uh, enjoyable stuff? I really liked the introduction. Yeah. Uh, I, I've talked a lot about just cartoon theme songs and, and sort of giving you that context to sort of place you into an episode properly with enough context, information, uh, catchy theme song. I'll say this, not really a theme song. Nah. Just not much of a theme song. And I don't know if that is a result of compiling three episodes together into the special. Probably some editing stuff. Yeah. Could have been, or if, uh, you know, there really wasn't much of a theme song and a lot of cartoons that we've actually talked about recently. It feels like the theme song is just simply kind of like a title card or screen that they have that kind of comes up and presents and shows you the, the name of the show just to use as a segue to kind of bring you into that world. Right. That's fine. Very fun moments at the beginning of this. Why? Because this is a cartoon that throws the weight of Universal's name yeah. at the top and to kind of bring you in. And their logo, the spinning globe, the kind of like you felt like you were watching the beginning of a movie, which exactly. was the idea here. It was supposed to be kind of like a almost a feature length recap. So it was kind of cool that they started the same way that a, a mummy movie would. So I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. It it definitely put me in that I'm about to watch a really fun mummy movie mm. mindset. Yeah. Which is good to uh, start. Uh, 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 that's a so, real hard, sharp yeah, turn for me. Yeah. But I, I will say as a first impression, that's awesome. That's cool. I really did enjoy that. That is super fun. The the intro recap, because again, not a theme song. So we really get a recap that yeah. breaks down a lot of the story points. I think it did a good job of kind of giving you background and context and information and then kind of putting you into the world. It was helpful for me. Was it a little long? Sure. Did it fill in a bunch of gaps that I don't remember? Because again, the mummy is over. The original mummy movie came out in 1999. Right. And, you know, so 21 years ago is when it was in theaters. I don't remember a lot of the information that was there. So to kind of have that Cliff Notes version of The Mummy and things that may have happened, that was very helpful to me. So I appreciated that. What I think was a little confusing, though, was we're watching a recap of season one, and it starts with a recap kind of of The Mummy, the original (laughs) movie. But then it was was also like it felt like it was at times 
foreshadowing what we were just about to see. So it was like recapping its own recap, but also its prequel recap at the same time. So it was a little confusing. They they even had some like not reused animation, but some of the exact same sequences, slightly uh, dif- animated slightly differently, which was odd to me. So there was like something in the recap. You pick up a, a bracelet, and they really had to kind of like dust it off and and break it out of like rock or whatever. And then later on, they go back to essentially the same temple and they just pick it up and it's just like it's fine there's nothing there's nothing else there so i was just like where are we in time like was this still like in antiquity or did they just leave it behind the last time (laughs) i was very confused with the the manacle which becomes very important in the rest of this series right and and, you know just seeing and kind of putting all the pieces together it's it's a little bit kind of curious because they talk about the manacle if you are a mummy verse fan (laughs) you're probably thinking to yourself, huh, that's weird because that was in The Mummy Returns and not the 1999 The Mummy. You are 100% correct. And this is where it starts to go off the rails. Yeah, it's where it goes off the rails a little bit. I will, I'll chat a little bit about where this falls in The Mummyverse in the next section because it's challenging. But first impression, mindset, I'm on a path for success. I'm interested. (laughs) The Mummy, here we go. you know that that's that's fun for me. So I'm 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 cued. I'm locked in. You know what else I liked about the beginning? What the fake out? <laughs> I really like that fake out. They they do kind of the traditional when you're in a, a globe trotting action adventure thing. You get the high level you know shot of the Earth or whatever or a map, and you kind of like mark your path across that map. And it starts right. to zoom in on obviously Northern Africa and Egypt. And you're like, okay, it's a mummy movie. We're going to Egypt. And then they're just like, zoop, they just make a left turn and just head north. And they take you to Scotland of all places. And I was just kind of like, huh, okay, we got a mummy movie, but we're starting in Scotland. So that to me at least was interesting. It made me pay attention a little bit more. So I like that. I like that kind of fake out. And I, I love the mechanic of going back and forth. One thing that I found to be very rewarding about this show is that they travel a lot. It's a lot of traveling. Yeah. You don't get to they see a are, lot of it in the this special, but they do travel quite a bit in the series itself, yeah. Right. I mean, they they I mean, even in even in these three episodes, yeah. you know, they're they're in Scotland yep. and then they're in London and then they're in Egypt and then they're on a train somewhere, somewhere. and they're, you know, then they're in then they're in France. And they end up in Paris, so yeah. They're in a bunch of different locations. Yeah. So this car, I I found that fun because this cartoon never stayed static for too long uh for all of the things that i think that we'll talk about in the <laughs> yeah, bad section right. this cartoon moved along at an action-packed pace which you have to for an action adventure yeah. period piece travel based like archaeological tale like it's like the classic indiana jones watching the kind of plane move across the map the dotted line as they chart their their way across the world, like that kind of stuff I love. Now, the CG globe was a little iffy in this, but it wasn't <laughs> bad. It was, it was nice, and it, it helped to really remind you where the family was at that given moment. Because like Sean said, they bounced around a lot. So it was good to know, wait, where are we again? Especially in this weird recap where it, it moves pretty quickly. Traveling along with the family, they, you know, as frequently as they do move between locations, they do a really good job, at least in, I'd say, the first third to the first two thirds of giving you an idea of perspective yeah. in terms of scale. They do a great job of showing you when they're walking into a tomb, the family is very, very small and it is a massive structure around them. So uh, it, it's not something where like you see them walking into a building and it's like a target, you know, where it, you, you get the standard size and structure of what everything looks like. These things are massive in scale and so it's like maybe two or three targets kind of like all stacked sure, just on stack top them of up each yeah other. yeah yeah stack them targets. the pyramids were the original like department stores i don't know if everybody <laughs> knew that or not but that's where we got the idea from <laughs> that's why you I mean, can just pro- move through the different mine shafts and just yeah go to different levels that's what the elevators were for obviously right yeah <laughs> i love that idea too <laughs> It was the first superstore. You know? It was. It was the first superstore. And they just kept making them bigger and bigger. It's crazy. <laughs> so they they do a great job of kind of showing that. In addition, the final point about travel, I love that they traverse the entire world in a dirigible. 
Yeah, that was fun. I mean, it that was very fun. It was sort of like any pre World War II stuff. You can kind of still get away with that. Post World War II, you, yeah, you don't really see too many Mm-mm. zeppelins floating around anymore. Um, but that was fun. Yeah, and it had an interesting plot point because sometimes if you're in that particular conveyance, you can get stranded relatively easily. Uh, so that was that was interesting to see too. Yeah, you don't see very many uh, dirigibles in cartoons these days. Right. So, and we should note there's the time period when this happens that Dave is mentioning. Help me understand this, David. Was it well, 1933, 1934? Supposed to be early to mid 1930s. Supposed okay. to be, but right. we'll get into that a little bit more as it relates to the live action movie verse. Right. Yeah. Can I talk uh, about the uh, voice cast a little bit? Please. Love it. Love the voice cast. I mean, it's yeah. a lot of the uh, a lot of the heavy hitters, the names that you know. So Gray Delisle, John Schneider, Tom Kenny, Jim Cummings, Jeff Bennett, mm. Kevin Michael Richardson. You should, if you guys have listened to any of our shows before, you probably know at least a few of those names. But we also have uh, Chris Marquette, Nicholas Guest, voicing some major roles too, and they've done quite a bit of TV work and movie work over the years. So right. really, really solid voice cast. They, you know, it wasn't nobodies. It wasn't up and comers it was pretty solid veteran cast for the most part universal was like we're gonna line this up for success yeah. and then we're gonna tell nobody about it it's yeah. i'll talk about that later on too because there are so yeah. many things here that are like yeah of course you got steven summers to be the executive producer of course you got this veteran voice acting cast of course you got these particular studios to animate it and of course you made this series to begin with because the mummy movies did pretty well everything makes sense and then <laughs> we'll see what happens. But uh, did you have a favorite kind of standout character at all? Uh, I want to say it was very hard because I think really? that you and I both had in and around the same characters that we liked. Okay. You can steal them. Uh, I I enjoyed Ardith. Yeah, Ardith is great. Right. And Ardith he was is... uh, Oded Fair in uh, the movies too, correct? So right. that's another character that comes over from the movie verse. Mm-hmm. So we have him. He I, not much in terms of an introduction. No. So if you went back and you made the linkage to the movie, it was a little bit more rewarding. But yep. you're gonna have to you're gonna have to turn some gears in your brain to kind of make that jump, which is fine. But you know you get sort of a, a swashbuckling, uh, you know, a sword particular person who's there, very action packed. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's good to see somebody who is kind of leaping into the fray to attack some of the problems and situations that they have head on. Is that necessarily the best method? Who knows? Didn't seem like there was a lot of game plan there other than just to jump Jump in with one or two swords at any given time. Possibly. I also want to say every time I've thought about learning to like use a sword, I've, I've, Every time I play a video game that has a sword, I'm like, oh, okay. maybe it'd be cool to figure out how to Ooh, use it. Like, no, bud. It's never, it's I'm never, never going to do it. Don't worry. Thing. I don't think that's it's, a good look these days either. <laughs> it's like the impression that I get when I go to a concert and I love mm. the concert and I walk away and I'm like, I should learn how to play guitar. At 40, I should figure out finally how to play guitar. It's not going to happen. So uh, it, You know what? If you're going to do one of those two, I'll take guitar over like a sword play uh, any day. Right. It's just the impression that I get from watching somebody do something cool. Yeah. Did you I go to a, a Mighty John Mighty Boss Tones concert? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That? Thank okay. you. You picked up on I that. I did indeed. Appreciate it. So it, it's, you know, it, like a, something fun like that, especially with the sword or swashbuckling and sword play that they yeah. have in this. I love that artists only move is to just sort of hold the sword out and just kind of use it as a blunt object <laughs> yeah. over and over You're, and over again. You, but he's evidently a really good swordsman. So you just reminded me of an LOL that I forgot to put in my notes. So remind me of that moment again. Uh, okay. Cause it happens in like the third act and it was really it funny. It does. Yeah. It sure I think does. You have it. So I think we'll be, Oh, good. I know. I know what it is. But now. I also love Ardith as a person of color and a person, a character who's actually from the area that most of right. this stuff kind of takes place. Whereas the rest of the uh, cultural appropriators are from far away. Uh, the colonists basically so we'll get to that in a little bit but honestly Ardith was Ardith was maybe first or second for me but I really liked Evie uh Mm -hmm. I really liked Evie as a character I feel like she had she was good in the movies but I feel like in the animated series we got a better sense of her background um as this archaeologist as this historian as an accomplished woman in her field who was actually for once being rewarded 
for that and recognized for it because this whole thing starts off with her getting a, a prestigious position at the, was it British Museum of Natural History? Something to that effect. Who knows? Who knows what it was, but at Who least she knows? was being recognized and rewarded by her uh, her bosses, essentially. And that right. weirdly sets up a conflict that just almost destroys the world from <laughs> here on out, which is part LOL, part bad writing. Uh, but I think Evie was a really strong character. I'll say I liked Evie more than Rick. Rick was kind of flat for me in this. Oh, Rick. I'll get into Rick in Yeah, that. Rick, you wait your turn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, my final sure. good point about this cartoon is I like the cool stuff that they hint at. Mm. The cool lore behind everything that's going on. They talk about Book of the Dead. Again, if you're Mummy Returns fan, these things are all going to kind of resonate. You're all going to kind of understand where we're coming from. Yeah. You you see sort of the strength of the mummy. He, at one point, he lifts a train car. Yeah. Which, crazy. He's got crazy Kinda powers, in, too. Like, you'd think, like, what does this guy need this these particular things for that Bobby talked about in the synopsis? Like, he's super powerful. I don't really think he needs this stuff, but anyway. He, he's so powerful that he can summon a sandworm from the Beetlejuice franchise yeah. in the middle of the desert. He can just cross franchises at will. It's amazing. That's, when the TIE fighters and the impressive. Death Star showed up, it was nuts. I lost it because I thought, what a great way to create another Star Wars franchise in the middle way. of a mummy verse. <laughs> Weird that it's on Peacock TV, but who knows? <laughs> exactly. Who knows? I feel like Disney Plus is going to give them a cease and desist mm-hmm. soon. And also then be like, should we all just copy Netflix? Okay, got it. Now we got it. Yeah, figured it out, guys. Good job. That's my final good moment is just sort of hinting at those those cool things that hopefully they deliver on or or crazy mummy powers that they actually show in the cartoon. Yeah. Anything else on the good end for you, Dave? Uh, I'll tie it back to what I said originally where the premise. I really like the premise. And you could see there were parts of this where they it looked like they were trying to take the best parts of obviously the mummy movies. But also things like Mummies Alive, which I think had come out a couple years before that. My timing might be off. But like Mummies Alive was an attempt to, I think it was, it had to be 90s because it was definitely like to extremify what you could do with mummies. Uh, but a little bit of Mighty Max thrown in there too as the yeah. action adventure focused on a kid. Because when you spin these stories, you have to make them kind of for kids if your show is supposed to be for kids. So it made sense that the kid was a protagonist. They had to figure out a way to do that. But the problem is they ended up Instead of taking all the best parts, they somehow ended up putting all the worst possible things from all of those together into what we got. Which I feel like is a good transition to the bad section. I feel like it is. Yeah. Yeesh. We could spend an hour probably talking about all the stuff that's not quite right it, about this show. Oh, yeah. Where this, do you want to start? This is going to be this is gonna be a challenge. Yeah. I, let's start at the beginning with the actual Mummy movie. Okay. I don't think we pull in a lot of times numbers, box office numbers about movies. Not usually, no. That have been adapted into a cartoon format. Yeah. But 1999, mm-hmm. The Mummy came out, mm-hmm. action adventure movie, cost $80 million to make. Okay. It brought in $416 million That was globally? At, yeah. Okay. At, 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 like across like all markets. Nice. That's an incredible amount. That's pretty good for you know? 99 bucks. And, and this, you know, we had had a Brendan Fraser as, you know, like late 80s, 90s actor, had been in a bunch of comedies, yeah. a bunch of like rom-coms. You know, he he had proven his his worth. Like yeah. he's, he's a great actor and a good leading man. He jumps into this, beefed up, yeah. got ready for this. Funny thing about this, I don't know, as a side note, this part for Brendan Fraser in The Mummy yeah. was originally offered to Tom Cruise, who wasn't able That's to do it. Weird. But then... Tom Cruise was then in the recent 2017, 2018 Something. mummy. We'll pretend movie? that movie didn't happen. I enjoyed oh, it, but yeah. what a disaster. Yeah, what a what a what a thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> the, the, the actual curse of the mummy is how bad most of these reboots have actually become and how hard it is for Universal to get this thing going. That's the actual curse. Yeah. Uh the mummy returns that I've mentioned now a couple times. Yeah. That can that cost them about $98 million as a budget, and it brought in $435 million. Pretty good, yeah. So, yeah, pretty good. That is, like, 
though that's a successful so of course you know so make a cartoon movie and sequel yeah, yeah so make a cartoon sell some toys get people hooked on the franchise let's make more exactly. of these movies what could possibly go wrong the oh boy let's dig into it uh so one of the things first and foremost that is a big problem for me i don't know where this <laughs> show actually is placed within when? these mummy movies yeah, like i don't when know when yeah uh in, in time and the chronology of how this works they are obviously really trying to to hit the the movie franchise tie-in right it just seems like they did not pay attention to the movies in certain instances which you know if you're going to do that type of synergy if you're going to kind of seed something in there get it right you guys as universal and nbc are creating this so don't mess it With up summers too like it, he was you know in charge of both movies and he was an ep on this series so you would think that if he had the story written out then this should have been a bridge in between but remember now guys this is before the mcu this is before like these these big mega cross-platform um cross-media cinematic universes so yeah they tried it they could have been the first you know universal monsters could have been the first cinematic universe they just beefed it so yeah. unfortunately with like this series uh there's definitely some not anachronisms but just some disconnects between what happens in the show and what happens in the movies right it just you know when we we talk about this particular cartoon we're more talking about the mummy returns right you know, which took place as as Dave mentioned, like in the like the mid nineteen thirties. The the movie itself, I think, takes place in nineteen thirty three. Okay. So again, based on what the age would have been for this kid, because he's presumably a teen. I don't know. He's anywhere from zero to thirteen years old, <laughs> somewhere in that I, range. He's he's anywhere from existent to not an adult. <laughs> somewhere right. in there, and it's he exists, and it's, but he's not yet an adult. Yeah. And it's very challenging because you think like this kid seems mature, but you know, in the in the second film, he's their eight year old son. Yeah. So in nineteen thirty three, he's eight years old. In this, he seems to be a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more older, yeah. uh, and understands the gravity of the situation. But they they co op pretty much the exact same idea. There's a bracelet; it gets attached to his wrist. They got to find a book of the dead. Blah 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 blah. Like. A bunch of fun things happened. Some really cool mummy CGI. <laughs> I wonder if I wonder if it was sort of a lost in translation thing. Like they had the same idea, but then they ran with it for the series. Summers was probably just like, "Here's what we're doing for the sequel," and just gave him like the the outline of the script, and then was just like, "Just run with it." Here's the basic premise: like it centers on this family unit. The kid gets the bracelet. The mummy tries to get it. That's it. Run with it after that. That makes sense because this. Cartoon went from 2001 until 2003, Correct. right? Yeah, it was only two and seasons. And in 2003, yeah. the movie from Sofia Coppola, Lost in Translation, was released. That makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. It was 100% Lost in Translation. Based on the mummy debacle. Yeah. <laughs> Sofia Coppola was just like, I got to put a movie together for everybody <laughs> with Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, I, a I mummy just... reboot with those two would be something else. I don't know who plays the, <laughs> the mummy, honestly. Oh watch the hell out of it would you yeah mm. i would i'd give it a shot sure i'm cautiously optimistic i mean we watched this thing so <laughs> yeah right i gotta so, say speaking of watching this i had a tough time visually with the show you mentioned the scale earlier yeah. but honestly even that didn't really stand out for me the whole thing feels half finished it feels right. unpolished it feels flat it feels it literally looks like i was watching like stick figures just kind of like dance across the screen because it, it just nobody had any depth to them character wise or like visually. There's just something so odd about this that it just felt like there was pieces that were missing. Yeah. I actually think I figured out some of what it is. What is it? So there are, as we mentioned, they travel a lot. Yeah. They're being attacked by the mummy all the time. All the there time. are a lot of action sequences that take place. The challenge is, is that when they are performing an action, yeah. let's say somebody diving uh, across a pit. Sure. There are moments where as they're making a transition in between like poses where the keyframe mm -hmm. doesn't feel like it's as seamless as it should be and it is visually noticeable <laughs> and upsetting. It's upsetting. It you it looks like 
somebody getting ready to jump and then they pause to think about the jump and lose all the momentum from running and then they leap. And it, it, if you don't understand exactly how I'm describing this, <laughs> one, I apologize. Two, don't watch this as a way to understand what I'm saying and how bad it is because you will just get frustrated. It just looks like somebody dropped a bunch of frames on the way to like the, the renderer and we're just like, eh, it's fine. <laughs> Just, we got half the frames we used to have. I'm sure it'll be fine. Just put it in and run it. But it's like even the character designs for me, they weren't, they just weren't good. They look really lazy. Um, the mummy designs, the creature designs, the landscapes are okay. The landscapes and the settings were, were fine, but it still felt half finished. It felt underpopulated. It felt there was no density to anything. It wasn't interesting. It felt very cheap. Honestly, if I'm going to, if like- I'm going to put a word on it, it'll be cheap. You didn't like Purple Skull Master from Mighty Max? My God, like he, they should have kept him as that weird, like half human, half the purple monster skull tongue <laughs> yeah. thing. It was cool. Like, have you guys ever actually seen a mummy? There was nothing about his transformations into or out of mummy form that were like <laughs> even close to the movie or anything believable. The closest thing was when his like jaw elongated and he had the like, uh, you know, like the sand sandstorm mouth. Uh, in the very early part, that was it. Everything yeah, else, he just, was... I don't know what he was supposed to be. It was really yeah, bad. I'm not sure either. What else didn't work, bud? A little bit weird. Uh, you talked a little bit about sort of some of the character design. I want to talk about the characters. Me too. Hate them. We, yeah, hate them. <laughs> they, I mean, other than the two that we talked yes. about, uh, hate them. You know, the, the challenging thing, Rick O'Connell. Rick O'Connell is the Brendan Fraser character yep. from The Mummy. He st- Dinks. He's real he, bad. He's flat. He's not interesting. Oh He's he, reactionary. Yeah. It is painful to watch him do stuff. It is painful to see him interact with the rest of the cast. <laughs> with humans. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll explain why, because I've written down like a list of, again, terrible dialogue sure. that happens in this cartoon. Like just atrocious. It's real bad. Like just bad end of scene we need a joke and we're tired and everybody's been in the writer's room for a couple hours and we just want to go to lunch what's that oh dave that's a that's a great contribution i also don't care write it down let's go to quiznos let's just get out of here it's they got a pepper bar so we gotta go i love the pepper bar Uh, bar. it's it's bad in addition to rick at one point in presumably episode 12 sure uh, or, like or the second act point, of this feature, yeah. Yeah, we bring in Simon Montgomery. Well, Ooh, Simon, what a, brother, what where did stinker. you come from? You weren't even what, on the wiki. What a stinker! Simon shows Don't up need out Simon. of nowhere. Does nothing. Simon shows. <laughs> Simon shows up. Super energetic. Very fun. Finally, this is the challenging thing. Yeah. The main character of this is not Brendan Fraser's nope. character Rick. It is his son yep. Alex. Which again, Mummy returns. Yeah. So they have Alex and they finally give him a friend, right. Simon, to play with because he's just about a, he's around a bunch of adults. And I'm presumably as a kid at that age, maybe not the healthiest interactions, especially just to drive around the world in a dirigible uh, yeah. and fight the super. I was going to say with the so, mummies coming after you, threatening your life to like rip a shiny bracelet off your wrist one way or another. Yeah, I will say surprisingly, though, he seems very well adjusted. He's for very the, chill. The for gravity that, yeah. of the situation. Yeah. He's like, you know what? I got this. He also likes the idea that yeah, he doesn't have to go to school. So he's just kind of right. like, cool, I'm down. Yeah. Yeah. Let's so take out the trash magically. They they finally give Alex a friend right. with Simon Montgomery who discovers his powers because Alex is too lazy to pick up two trash cans and walk him to the curb. So he uses his manacle powers to to do this. That sounds made up. That sounds like Sean is making stuff up off the top of his head. Now that's a hundred percent how it plays <laughs> yeah, out in the in the promise episode. You like I'm that not. it's just, that's it. He puts a golden aura around two trash cans and makes them like dance their way to the curb. It's pretty so bad. Simon gets excited. Yeah. We see Simon. He is pumped about this. Pumped. Can't shut up about the Avengers. Again, it's weird to think that like the Marvel Cinematic <laughs> Universe watched this cartoon yeah. and we're thinking we could do yeah, that. We gotta get our stuff together. We could do that. Yeah. This is a this is a failed opportunity yeah. on the Mummyverse side of things. Yeah. So they they bring him along on the journey. He is super pumped. He's put in a little bit of danger, and then he's like, "I'm gonna go meet my parents in Cairo. I'm out of this. I'm like, out. I do not want to be here anymore." He's like, "I've and then been they burned. I've been rid in a of sandworm. You just never see Simon again. You never see him again." <laughs> and then in the thirteenth episode, or the end of this, the final third that we watched yeah. for this. They're like, let's bring in a cute little lovable animal. It was as if they were 
they were workshopping or live and this is a dumb thing to do after the animation is already done like they were user testing things is simon relatable would he be a good friend for season two is this ferret that we're gonna call tut is this the cute animal that this show has been missing Maybe. these are all key elements that you would bring into a cartoon but you should see them earlier in the process <laughs> to make them enjoyable down the road now we they don't did None of that. We don't know where Tut showed up. I mean, except for us, yeah, in the third act of this feature. But you would imagine he just showed up in like the somewhere between the twelfth and thirteenth episode. I have no idea where I, this thing came from. No idea. Nope. No idea. I like completely missed the mark. For that me, happens so. with the recaps, though. <laughs> I, I got to ask you this though: Simon being complete throwaway character, but as far as having to spend time with the rest of these numbskulls, is there any of them who did you hate the most out of the rest of these like supporting characters? Colin. Yeah, Colin. And you're kind of supposed to. So I feel like... I hated Colin because yeah. of the bad dialogue. I hated him more for his original like villainous motivation. I didn't mind him being this sort of sniveling, servile servant to uh, Imhotep the mummy. Because that's his job, right? We're supposed to hate him. His name is Colin Weasler to begin with. So you're, you're kind of supposed to hate this guy. But I hated his motivation which was essentially that Evie got the job, the promotion that he thinks he deserved. And that was enough for him to steal the Book of the Dead, go to Egypt, revive this long dead uh, world threatening mummy and bring him back to power. That was all it took. It was just basically like career jealousy. That's all it was. I, by, I my complaint about Colin in addition to that, because oh, that God. is garbage. So that bad. is just filth. Colin has these pot shot one-liners that he he tries to make at the end of things to transition to a next scene. Again, just garbage dialogue the entire time, such as and including someone woke up on the wrong side of the sarcophagus. You know what? Bury yourself, Keep it. Colin. Keep it, just Colin. Shut up. Keep it to yourself next time. Think he, about it. At, tweet it if you have to. <laughs> Keep it to yourself, bud. At one point, he actually says, introducing uh, Imhotep. Uh, the 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 villainous mummy that we had. Like he goes, episode thirteen. Have you? He goes. Have you met my friend, Imhotep? Oh boy, so <laughs> sassy. Up. And it was in like episode thirteen. Like, yeah, you've been chasing us for thirteen episodes already. It's been six and a half hours of this nonsense. He's got one moment where he says he's getting away. Why didn't you turn him into a marshmallow? Because Imhotep is shooting lightning bolts. Yeah, and I like it's bad. every it's just, everything. It's just napkin jokes. Stinks. Everything stinks. Everything. I, and stinks. like we said in the good section, remember that we praise the actors. The actors do their damnedest yes. with these yes. lines. The writing is awful. And I should mention, the writers were actually good. Like they had done a ton of other stuff and have gone on to do plenty of other quality stuff. Ben Ten. Spectacular Spider-Man, I think, are some of their claims right. to fame. They've done a ton of really good work. This is not one of them. So, yeah. I, and even, like, like Jonathan, he's supposed to be kind of the snarky, kind of pain brother. Just another one-liner delivery machine. Like, Ugh. he was supposed to be the comic relief, as tends to happen. He's just more annoying than anything else. Al, the protagonist, I can't stand him. I can't stand this kid. The protagonist of the, of the show. <laughs> I couldn't stand him at all. What did you think about yeah. Alex? Uh, again, he was as one note and as boring as his dad. <laughs> yeah, basically. So I guess he gets that from him. I wish he and took because, after yeah, his mom. Like father, like son. Yeah. Which the, was the highest rated episode of season two, the whole right. series. The, uh, the, the keyframe must fall not very far from the animator studio. That's because, a yikes. That's a nap right. kitten joke right there. Yeah. That is just, it's, that's the level of thought but no man like what feels like the show when, off the cuff nonsense your protagonist is supposed to be like a kid that you can see yourself being right you're a kid watching a kid's show you want right. to see yourself in this position like put nothing yourself he did in that role yeah put yourself in that manacle nothing he did was uh admirable <laughs> was useful he learns how to like manipulate the magic of this manacle and he uses it as a deus ex machina to get them out of everything everything <laughs> There's very I, little puzzle solving. There's very little ingenuity. It's just a lot of fights and magic manacle. Yeah. This brings me to, I, I mean, again, we could probably complain about the bad forever. All day. I'm not going to belabor these points. Yeah. But I do want to talk about my final thing is a litany of problems that I have just about this show's logic. Sure. And you bring internal up Internal logic. Great... We're not saying like like real world logic, right? Like internal logic. 
yeah, the yeah. internal mythology, shows, whatever, yeah, like mythology and right. logic. You bring up a really great one that he's using this manacle as this Deus Ex Machina for just about everything. Yeah. And in the first two thirds of what we've watched, he is presumably using Egyptian language spells to be able to use that manacle's power. Right, right? for all kinds of crazy stuff. Some yeah, of them are really well animated, stuff. actually, too. The, yeah, the one on, uh, in like Paris. Like those trash cans just dancing the down tra- the street. The trash cans was on one end of the spectrum. The giant like wire fence hands that came from... I'm doing this to the camera so our, our viewers can get the general <laughs> idea. Uh, the wire fence hands. That was really cool. I actually really liked that animation. That was really well done. Right. That's on the other it's, end of the spectrum. It was very good. Yeah. I take problem with the logic that when he, again, coming out of context, this is not going to make any sense. But at one point in the final episode, he fights a Minotaur. Yep. I know. Don't worry about it. You're no better. You're no worse. Look, uh, if you can it, believe the mummies, you should be able to believe the Minotaurs, unlike the yeah, people it, in the show itself. At, at one point, the the Minotaur is, I think, threatening Ardith. Mm-hmm. And instead of using an Egyptian language spell to activate the manacle, he just goes, sword, come alive. Yeah. And the sword comes alive so and like, it threatens the And I, in the that whole moment, time you could have just been... I went, you've been building <laughs> on, why did you just throw it away? Maybe they didn't have a translator. It just. There were you know, so they're... many things like that though, right? So like Alex's powers or his understanding, his control over the manacle changes uh, at, a, at a whim at a drop like at one point he can basically like like i said he can get those like hands to come out from like a wire fence or he can summon uh, statues to life or he can make bricks appear out of out of nowhere or levitate people and send them flying but then other times he's like man get the magic doesn't work the same way all the time and he just like slightly moves a pebble or whatever and he's doing the same stuff so there's no internal logic of kind of like him learning, him progressing, him getting stronger, him becoming more knowledgeable. It's just yeah. whatever suits the the situation at the time. It's frustrating. It's just bizarre. <laughs> yeah, it's, just biz- it's just frustrating. Yeah. It's just very frustrating. Yeah. It, my final, I guess, case in point about the logic mm-hmm. is that at one point, our our mummy, uh, Imhotep, is... He's, I think he's trapped in those, those hand, in yeah. the, the, like the, <laughs> the wire mesh hands yeah. that have kind of restrained him. And he goes, uh, he wants to go full sandstorm, yep. which he's know, been he, doing for 13 episodes. He's been, yeah, he's been doing for 13 no episodes. No problem. He, he wants to be able to get out of a, a situation that he's in. This is like his, uh, his Deus Ex Machina. But again, it's been, it's in, the movies so i mean he can do it yeah. no you know and no, in, no the, fault. in the series 12 yeah, episodes in the series. We've seen this, yeah so at this point uh our jonathan evie's uh brother takes a seltzer bottle takes Ugh. a comically large seltzer that bottle just happened to be there and, the top yeah, of the Eiffel just, tower and spritzes him because <laughs> you know if you apply seltzer or water to sand it's i just at that just point mud I just, storm. I got so frustrated. It was very cartoonish at that point. And yes, yeah. I know, dear listeners, it's a cartoon. But it's the difference between like clownish kind of humor and, and like Sean's talking about with like the internal mythology of how the world works. Uh, yeah. I just think they didn't care. It was a napkin joke, 100%. Yeah. Just a napkin gag. I mean, there was I mean, funny stuff in here, intentionally yeah, or there, otherwise. Yeah, there, 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 there was. There were, there were like fun little moments. And I, I'm looking forward to kind of talking about those in a second. <laughs> Because uh, some of them are fun and some of them are like fun, oof. but then yeah, oh yeah, I just went oof yeah. at the end, a lot real hard. That's my I again. I could probably I feel like I could write a cartoon dissertation about why this cartoon wasn't successful. Yeah, but that's it for me on bad for right now. <laughs> I think I'm good too. I'm already yeah. laughing, so I kind of want to get to the the funny stuff to close it out. Okay, we're now at the LOL. Yeah, Dave, I want to remind you. Yeah, please. Sword play <laughs> and artist. <laughs> so Sean already mentioned the Minotaur. Yeah. <laughs> which when the Minotaur shows up, there's another funny thing that I still can't wrap my head around. But at one moment, Ardith is taking his sword like straight to the Minotaur. Coming coming at him hard. <laughs> He's been dispatching like skeleton warriors and everything else through this entire series. And the first thing he screams at the Minotaur is, We come in peace. <laughs> <And it> just <laughs> 
I was like, you kind of mixed messages there, bud. Like, you kind of, I don't know which one of these I believe. You're trying to hit just, me with a sword. Just like a karate chopping yeah, straight motion. straight down, chop to the sword, chest, just... like a kill stroke, just right to the minotaur. We come in peace. Come in peace. Like, well, pick one <laughs> or the other, but maybe yeah. cool it a little bit. There's a lot of just weird disconnects between the animation, the character faces sometimes, and then their actions too. So, yeah, that's a funny one. For me, I laughed every time they wiped in between scenes okay and we haven't it, talked it, about a wipe in a long time we haven't yeah. we haven't but this was enjoyable yeah if you're familiar with like the star wars wipes that they do when they transition in between scenes or they're the, very notable the brave star that, wipes which are some of my favorites in cartoon mm-hmm. history they still are they're yeah, still they're so still good. classic this is great because the wipe in between scenes is just a sandstorm that kind of comes across <laughs> just, just right across the screen up. That's pretty clever. It's, it's so silly, but every time it happened, I just I I'm dating myself now at this point. It Please. made me think of Da Rude Sandstorm. Yeah, of course. And every time every time that sandstorm, I just kind of went like And now we're going to get DMCA. We were doing pretty good up until that point, but now Da Rude's I was like I was less than 5 seconds on that, so I think we're fine right now. We both did it and I'm going to loop it for 10 hours, so. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, that was that made me laugh. A lot. Can I tell you something that made me laugh because of my perspective now in 2020 where all things yeah. are terrible and all people should be canceled and everybody should be reset? Yeah. A long for a long time Egyptology uh has been a very kind of like western thing of like oh look at these uh, things that we discovered as we like move aside the people who have lived there for thousands of years and are just like oh these are neat let's take them back home and <laughs> show everybody at home. The mummy is kind of like It's based on that idea. Now, part of it is, yeah, based on this actual history of it. But I would love kind of a modern take where it actually focuses on the people who live there and their understanding of the culture and the mythology and all that. And let them have a chance to actually have an action adventure based around, I don't know, their own culture and history would be interesting. But I do love that there was a a weird kind of wink and a nod to sort of cultural appropriation or just like this, this white privilege uh, just go storm in and take anything you want and, and take it back home because this thing opens up with the O'Connells, uh, a very, you know, white, non-traditional, kind of traditional family, just destroying uh, an old Scottish castle, an old Scottish like manor house. It's dilapidated. There's not a whole lot of stuff in it. It's in ruin. And they're just wandering through it, just like taking stuff. So like... and. and- yeah, go ahead. But what are they destroying it for? The, what is what do they walk away with? The first thing that Evie picks up is a Mongolian salad bowl, I think. Yep. And I'm like, why is this here? And why do you want it? But then the fact that Alex, the little shite, like basically single handedly destroys the entire castle. It was just like, perfect. This is exactly what I wanted. It's all terrible. I hate these characters. This is a <laughs> terrible thing. But it made me laugh. <laughs> I I had a laugh. And then an oof. Mm, there's when, a lot of those. When Alex and his dad are talking about Uncle Jonathan, mm. and they and Alex just goes, "He's an ir." They're talking about not wanting him to bring him on the adventure, mm-hmm. and they and Alex just goes, "Well, you know, he is an irresponsible pain in the bum." Right in and the I was bum. like, "Huh, okay, bum. That's kind of funny." British. Yeah. And then and then it's followed up immediately. Like immediately with Rick just going, "Yeah," and they're in their dirigible. They're in the dirigible. Mention yep. location. And he just goes, we're already full of hot air. And I just let out an audible. Oh, it's so bad. why? It's so bad. It's so. <laughs> uh, another thing that I found really very funny. This I this happens in the first I third. I love this. This happens in the first third. And, uh, you know, we 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 have Evie getting the promotion yeah. and, and contingent upon the promotion the director of this science foundation or this museum is yeah. like, you're going to get on a plane and you're going to Egypt at night. Immediately. Like, immediately. Right now. Like, you and the family. Go, take the kid with Go you. to the airfield. Yeah. Get on the We jet. got a dirigible full of hot air ready to go. Right. <laughs> exactly. So they they get there and they show up. They're doing their thing. They're figuring some stuff out. And so Colin, Colin has been snubbed for this promotion. Colin shows up and <laughs> uses a blow dart immediately. to incapacitate <laughs> two of the guards that are outside of the temple of where they are. So he like shoots a blow dart at one person. And then with the book of the dead, again, mummy returns Mm -hmm. that he steals from the museum, 
thousand year old tomb artifact probably yeah yeah exactly <laughs> artifact unbelievably delicate yeah he priceless hits a guard <laughs> over the head with this, this clobbers thing. him how did it not turn into dust? I don't know. I just, I laughed so hard. It just the ridiculous. It, and then clunk. it's like, first of all, you had a blow dart ready to go, but you only had one. So the other guy, he had to take this priceless artifact, clonk him over the head. But I love his escalation from like, man, that was my job from like that to just full on super villain. And then it's immediately followed by him reviving Imhotep from the dead, at which point he becomes surprised. That it actually worked. Yeah. His reaction when Imhotep rises is one of the funniest things in this entire series because it's kind of like, what did you think was going to happen? That you made the trip all the way here, blow darted a guard, and then knocked another one out, and then cast the spell anyway. Like, clearly that's what you wanted to happen. Why are you surprised? This is very funny. Unintentionally so. But I I gotta ask you this though, like, look, in this real world of ours, if you happen to cross a mummy... If you happen to cross skeleton warriors that were animated and shambling after you, if you happen to cross, you know, legions of scarab beetles or whatever that were under the control of some, like, ancient necromancer, would anything else really surprise you? Like, if you saw minotaurs or griffins or ghosts or drac, would anything else surprise you anymore? Or would you think, like, everything's possible? I I would assume at that point that just everything was on the table yeah. in terms of how crazy this was going to get. And for some reason, our characters are continually surprised by every <laughs> supernatural thing that shows up, regardless of the fact that they now have a years documented history of fighting these same things. And there's a manacle attached to their son's wrist that lets him just levitate objects at will. So that was a little frustrating, but it was also funny. There is a moment where the dirigible itself yeah. is filling up with scarabs. Yeah. The big and fight scene on the dirigible. Artif, yeah. be- his plan. <laughs> well, he he prefaces this. He prefaces this, and it's in the movies that these things, anything that they touch, they can just destroy them. They'll just the eat them yeah. and destroy them. Right. The, the it's like the dip. Right away. Yeah, it's the dip. Yeah. Uh, so Artif is like, if they touch you, they could destroy you. His plan is to swipe his sword at all of these little small insects <sighs> that are. That are running across. Like, and look, then man, even a Rick's, normal scarab, like the sword's probably not your best option. Yeah. Uh like Rick's idea is even worse. He's just gonna whip the ground. <laughs> just individually. <laughs> just whip individu- individual like, scarabs. Whip individual. <laughs> I at this point I was like, I hope somebody has a pistol in this dirigible that's filled with all this hot air. It's and I hope up. that they just start shooting. Cause <laughs> this this family deserves better. So one of the one of my other laugh out loud moments came from this dirigible fight because it's <laughs> taking place in a couple different different places. At some point, a hole gets ripped in the side of the dirigible and it starts to it starts <laughs> to sink. I think it's E B on the ground below is like looking up at it and just being like, Oh, that's something you don't see every day. And it's Rick's butt in the hole of the dirigible that's just like plugging it up so that it doesn't immediately crash. And that was a genuinely, honestly funny napkin joke. Like somebody was yeah. just like, well, during the fight, how about if Rick's butt just like plugs up the hole and then they see it from below? Like that to me was actually funny. That was, I, was I did enjoy good. that. That's was was clever. Good. Yeah. The one time in the entire series. I mentioned and I talked a little bit about at the very beginning, they do a good job with the lack of theme song with kind of giving yeah. you this context. And it's done with sort of a movie trailer voice. Again, you're coming in from the Universal pictures kind of intro title card movie trailer voice is sort of kind of getting you primed excited about this yeah 22 minutes into this when they need to segue <laughs> and transition from episode one over 12 to 12 they and have 13, to skip 11 episodes yeah they do sort of a quick smash cut montage of yeah. all the things and then movie trailer voice comes on again and is just like the family takes to the sky determined to find the scrolls before imhotep and i just i I thought I looked, my first instinct was to look at the time bar yeah. where I was watching this and be like, oh, we are 22 minutes exactly, exactly at the end of a normal this. production run of an episode. Yeah. I think that was Dan LaFontaine. I think he actually did the narration for that moment. Yeah. Because, he, oh. I mean, he, I'm pretty sure he did the mummy movies because he did everything in like 99, 2000. So I'm pretty sure it was him. And I, I like that's kind of cool too that they brought him in to give this like a movie feel. Just the rest of it, they could have used a little more money. <laughs> if I could make a suggestion, shoot, when they skipped two through eleven, yeah, just skip 
two through the end of season two. <laughs> sure. Just skip everything. Just skip everything. Once you get just to Dan LaFontaine, the, yeah. just that's it. The just end. give me just give me that LaFontaine and bring me all the way home. That's all that's all I needed. Speaking of bring it home, I only have one uh one more funny thing. Me too. Okay. You want to go first? Sure. Uh when they're in Paris, they are in an <laughs> opera house. Yes. And there is a character how they, that's how, real there. quick, how do they get to Paris? How do they know to go directly to Paris? Because didn't Simon put together the puzzle? And I don't, I actually don't even know. Simon put together point. an ancient Egyptian puzzle made of essentially like fired clay bricks shaped into puzzle Jenga pieces. And then, oh, it just contained a hologram of the Eiffel Tower. Right. <laughs> so like and a full on like, projection go to Paris. of the Eiffel Tower. I'm like, well, I guess the, the bad guys know where we're going too, but oh well. I guess anyway. we're going to, we're going to ride these griffins oh, out of here because our dirigible blew up, so which bad. was actually legitimately very funny. It is very funny, especially because they were like real jank looking griffins. Those are uh, some of yeah. the jankiest griffins I've ever seen. I've, there's so much jank in this that just made me laugh. Mm. Uh, so in this moment, they they get to Paris. They find this opera house. They go into the opera house and they ask this. I, he may have been a worker. Janitor? Or just a, who knows, you know, <laughs> uh, facilities person, administrator. Yep. Uh, and they, they ask him, they're like, you know, how do we get below this? And he goes, oh, you cannot because that is where. The kitty comes. The kitty comes. Oh, no, no, no. Like, no. Wait, you tourists. Like, wait, are, where are, like, what accent and yeah, where I'm are we right now? The He's kitty like, comes. You cannot, because the kitty comes. And I was like, kitten comes? No, no, no. What kitty the? comes. I, I laughed so stupid hard because there, there's a lot of bad accent work. You also in this, know that it's Jim Cummings. Like, you can just hear it. Yeah. Like, you know it's just Jim doing, like, a kitty, uh, com- kitty combs. A terrible this, French I, accent of this French janitor. It's so I laughed bad. so hard at that so funny. for no good reason other than I just needed to break the tension. <laughs> he turns aside and he's like, tourists. Tourists. It's funny stuff. You can't do that stuff anymore. You have to get an actual Parisian to play a Parisian janitor, I guess. But And why would you not? Sure. Because you know why? Because if they had actually gotten somebody who was Parisian, they to wouldn't say this, said I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have crapped on their pronunciation <laughs> for this and laughed so stupid hard at it because it was, it was really so funny. bad. Yeah, it was very yeah. Funny. That was we had the same one. We had the same LOL. Oh, was it? Other than the janky Griffins, <laughs> oh, yeah, God. we had the same LOL. He was great. He was a, a character that should mean absolutely nothing in this entire story. He should just be a guy who's just like, yeah, catacombs right over there. But instead, he has this like great <laughs> moment uh, for no reason. Because yeah, the show is a complete does. disaster. <laughs> well, as we mentioned yeah. very early, we are now going to get to the point where we are going to give our recommendations. Oh, buddy. And how, how we can do this is we can say we recommend this show and we can tell you why we think it's a good use of your time. We can also say that we don't recommend a show and we can tell you why we don't like it that much yeah. or why we don't feel very passionate about it. Uh and kind of give you our our synopsis based on again just this you know three episodes that we've had a chance to watch for this. If we really don't like a cartoon, we can go one step further, and we can give it the Who Framed Roger Rabbit style dip, where we dunk this cartoon, and again we only talk about it if ever yeah. to ridicule or just reference the list of cartoons that we have dipped. Someday we may have a dip special where we possibly consider the idea of maybe undipping if you guys you know donate enough money no if you raise enough uh, uh ruckus maybe we'll undip something but we still haven't done that because we don't have that uh, many dipped i feel like the 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 fan that's out there that's just like you know the ace ventura animated series really was a gem it's just jim and to that i would yeah. say no no it really wasn't. i don't even think jim carrey wants it no ah uh, so we're now at the point where we can give our recommendation dave we talk about the mummy <laughs> quest for the lost scrolls how are you feeling about this uh yikes i think you've you've figured it out from our bad section like there is just so much working against this show even the initial premise and idea i don't think is enough to save it i i definitely cannot recommend this even to like the most diehard mummy fans because it quite honestly does nothing to (laughs) to give to the story at all it's the same characters from the movies like Sean mentioned a couple of times, it's almost the exact same plot without really progressing it anywhere. And it does not add anything to the mythology that's interesting, that's unique, that folds in other characters, other cultures. They travel all around the world, but they don't really do anything. I can't recommend it. And uh, come back to me on whether or not we dip it. 
Okay. Yeah, can't recommend it though. Okay. Sorry, Peacock. How about you? Yeah. Uh, I am not going to recommend this either <laughs> for a lot of the reasons that I've already talked about. Yeah. This cartoon felt like a glorified and janky video game fetch quest Oof. with no payoff at the end of the fetch quest. <laughs> I have no idea how or where this fits into the Mummy movie franchise. Uh, and, and you think about this, there have been shows like Young Indiana Jones Chronicles yeah. that came out in the 90s that kind of added something fun. It filled in a backstory. Uh, it, it gave you some more of that particular character that you wanted to see. I don't feel like I got any of that from this cartoon I felt like, if anything, it made me more confused about The Mummy Returns. Mm. And it, it was just, it was disappointing. It was disappointing in terms of, and I'm a, I'm a big Brendan Fraser, The Mummy fan. Yeah. And this. The good news was he had nothing to do with this. So. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> so Brendan Fraser, you are a You're gem. Safe. You're safe. You are 100% safe. This felt like a debacle. And I want to say I'm really glad that this is free on Peacock because if I actually had to search or pay money to watch this, yeah. I would be embarrassed. Yeesh. I would be upset. I would be frustrated. Yeah. And I would let anybody know that they are <laughs> going to feel all three of those exact same emotions by watching this program. This is a dip for me. It's a dip for you. It's a dip for me. Uh you know what we've talked about in the past? Just kind of go with my gut. I don't know if I'll dip it, but I'll feed it to the scarabs, which is the exact same thing. So, yeah, that's a dip. That's a dip. That's a dip. That is a dip. Which Man. is crazy. I did not expect, of all things, like the mummy to dip it. But yeah. there's nothing There's nothing good about it. Like there's, <laughs> there's a couple funny things, but they don't do anything to make it worthy of its existence. They even kind of buried it back in the day. Like, I don't remember this at all. And now I kind of know why, because it's really bad. If you take the characters like Evie and Rick and, and Alex and, and you know, all hit Simon, yeah, and, and Jonathan and all of these classic, you know, not classic, but all of these important sure. yeah. people from the movie franchise right. and you put them into a cartoon and you make them unbelievably unlikable, yeah. I don't think that the cartoon should continue to even serve the name the mummy right make it something else make it well, you know they tried that white in... privilege jet setter <laughs> destroy Destroyers. an irish castle cartoon that's a better title they tried in season two they they had the secrets of the medjai so at the end of season one we get this reveal that uh you know ardith is a medjai is kind of like a uh people a family line who's been tasked with protecting all the stuff in the tombs and keeping the mummy like literally under wraps all that stuff and then we learn that uh, Alex is going to be trained as a Medjai. That's interesting, but we didn't watch any of season two. And I don't know if it's enough really to add to the story. And remember, too, we, we talked about this before. If we dip a derivative title like this, that doesn't affect anything from the overall uh, movie verse. So right. dipping this does nothing to the Mummy movie, does nothing to the Mummy property, does nothing to Mummy Returns, or even Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, even if it should. Or the new Mummy movie with Tom Cruise. None of that changes. It's literally just this title that gets erased. If it was the other way around, if they had based, for some reason, something off of this animated series, then yeah, unfortunately that would have to go too. But that's not the case this time. So feed it to a bucket of scarabs. There it is. Yep. The Mummy, yes. Quest for the Lost Scrolls. Never heard Dipped. of it. Never heard Dipped. of it. Never, we'll never, never see it. I don't think again. it doesn't exist. doesn't exist. I'm Sorry, okay Peacock, you got a 404 page. God. Golly. Golly. Oh. Golly. Well, Ooh. on a positive note, yeah, we're done talking about this show. <laughs> <laughs> also, you heard him on this episode, our friend Bobby Anthem. Woo. You can hear him on his paranormal podcast, Inhuman Experience, along with his co-host Bobby Blades. Find them on Twitter at IEXP underscore podcast. And Bobby also has a solo show that is in the exact same stream of Inhuman Experience. You can find it. It's called In Search of My Lost Soul. Watch it. Listen to it. I highly recommend it. Uh, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, just about anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Hey, Dave, what do you got going on? Same old stuff, bud. You can find me over at Collider.com. Still editing, 
writing, playing video games. If you want to chat me up, you can find me on Twitter at Dr. Claw MD. Well, I will not follow you. Uh, if you want to read some stuff, <laughs> check out. this in, aren't you? <laughs> check out not just you, literally everybody out there. Uh, you can read The Science of Breaking Bad from MIT Press, available wherever fancy science books are sold. What's new with you, bud? As always, when we're not in a pandemic, yeah. I do live improv comedy in Washington, D.C. with a group that's called Knox. That's N-O-X exclamation point. You can find tickets and times at dc.org. We are doing some uh, shows that are streaming on Facebook Live or, or YouTube Live. Nice. So you can always go to witdc.org. Uh, I think at the time that we're recording this, I think we have another one that's going to be at the end of July. So you can check it out there. Cool. So watch me from the comfort of your home. Yeah. And safety Along with, too. Yeah, exactly. More importantly, the safety aspect of it. Yeah. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Paul Ellis. If you message me, just let me know that you listen to the show just so that I know to follow you back and not be weird about it because <laughs> I appreciate you guys reaching out to me Shots and fired. let me know. No, no, I'm just saying like, I, I just, I want to know. That's all. Now Sean's uh, firing shots at me because he's still mad that I unfollowed him on Twitter and oh, refused geez. to follow him back even on his birthday. Oh, that, this is brutal. It is brutal. Uh, it's fun if you only followed me for one day a year, but you didn't tell me what day it was. Oh, that would be interesting. That's an idea. Yeah, I've I'll essentially dipped Twitter, so never to be talked of again. Uh, finally, I do a improvised comedy podcast that's called The Bureau. I do this with some of the guests that have been on this show, Isabel Galbraith, who was on King of the Hill, and Jamal Newman, who's been on a bunch of different episodes. Yeah. Uh, both of them are super fun. We do this also with our friend Jesse Chimes. It's the idea of if you were to have four people who worked at the FBI who decided to record a podcast in a break room uh, during lunch. So we do this show. It's available anywhere that you can find podcasts as well. The Bureau. It's a lot of fun. Check it we, out. Uh, yeah, we've wrapped up season two. So I think the rest of that new episodes come out Saturday until the, the end of season two is completed. Awesome. For us, for SMC, want to support us? Oh my gosh, you're like the nicest human being in the world. So nice. Go to our Patreon and search Saturday Morning Cartoons. Just remember, it's morning with you. Mm -hmm. You can become a patron over there. You can also just tell a friend. You can review us on Apple iTunes. We don't know how Apple iTunes works, but evidently it helps. So who knows? Slide into our DMs on Twitter at Morning Tunes. Remember, that's morning with you. Check us out on Instagram and Facebook, Saturday Morning Cartoons. Drop us an old-fashioned email, SaturdayMorningCartoons at gmail.com. You can find all of these links and more and how to recommend a cartoon to us in the bio for all of our social media accounts. There's a little link tree link and it has a bunch of buttons on how to do and find all of this stuff. And as always, you can listen to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, anywhere. Find podcasts are sold. Thank you so much for listening and we will be back next week. See ya. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transform and roll out.